So I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm sitting on Aboriginal land, specifically this is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. So my name is Emma Carmody. I'm a special counsel with the Environmental Defenders Office, and I'm also legal advisor to the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands and advisor to the 171 contracting parties to the convention. I normally focus on water law and policy, but today I'm taking a break from that and I'm delving into the world of energy law and policy with our guests, Dan Cass and Lane Crockett. Before we get started, I will just um, explain a few of the basics of how things will work today. So I'll be posing questions which Dan and Lane are going to answer. I've enabled the question and answer function. So people in the audience can ask questions. I'll have a look at those throughout the webinar and I'll try and synthesize them and insert them at appropriate points or ask them at the end. Um, and I just ask that people, uh, when you're making comments and ask, asking questions, and I'm sure all of you will do this, that you just keep them civil and respectful. Thank you. So um, I'll introduce today's webinar, which as you know, focuses on uh, regulatory barriers within the energy sector. So I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar on behalf of the Environmental Defenders Office. As I just said, this webinar will be examining regulatory barriers within the energy sector, which serve to limit the uptake of renewable energy and to that extent stifle our ability to decarbonise the Australian economy. This is the first in a series of webinars being run by the EDO, each of which will examine regulatory barriers in a specific area of law and policy, which inhibit green economic stimulus. The genesis for this series is really quite simple. I observed some months ago that think tanks, conservation groups, economists, and indeed entire economic blocs, namely the, the European Union, were publishing and promoting visionary blueprints designed to achieve the dual goals of economic recovery and environmental sustainability, and in particular, carbon neutrality. So as I read through these excellent and inspiring documents, I realised that no one was really discussing the kind of law reform that was required to execute and implement these ambitious green recovery plans. I also realised that when most people think about environmental law, they think of laws that directly govern biodiversity, nature and natural resources more generally. However, energy policy, corporations law, superannuation law, taxation law, all of these highly complex and esoteric areas are hugely determinative of how our environment is managed or conversely mismanaged. All influence the extent and speed at which we can decarbonise our economy. And so this series was born. It's a series that I hope will improve people's understanding of these different areas of law and policy, I hope that at the end of today's discussion, you will have a sense of the crucial role that energy law and policy plays in decarbonising our economy and the kind of reform that is required to increase market penetration by renewables. So that's enough from me. I'm going to now hand over to the stars of today's show, namely Dan Cass and Lane Crockett. And we're very lucky to have them here with us today as they are two of Australia's leading experts in energy markets and renewable energy. So I'm going to ask each of you, Dan and Lane, to just introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you work and what you do. And I might just start with Dan. Great, thank you, Emma. And thank you, EDO, for hosting this series. I think it's a cracking idea. I'm glad lots of people have logged on um, from the safety of homes. Um, and workplaces. Uh, I'm, I'm locked in, lock, locked down Melbourne myself. Um, but first, I should acknowledge the um, Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation and uh, pay respects to elders past, present, and leaders' future. Uh, so I, I, I have a background in science and science history um, and worked as a museum curator for a number of years and was always an environmentalist and interest, interested in how big complex change happens. How do we change systems? Uh, climate change then was called global warming and I worked for 
Climate Action Australia, which was the first climate campaign in the country. This is in 1991. I went to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 as the observer representing the Australian Conservation Foundation. And the thing that always most worried me about global warming was the political economy. I'm not an engineer, but I have faith that engineers and scientists can invent energy systems that are affordable and zero carbon. I think that's possible. The thing I could never get my head around is how does democracy put fossil fuels in the corner? Do you see how weak political parties and democracies are dealing with these big problems? And it seems to me it's always about the politics of energy. So uh, I haven't solved that in 27 years, but hopefully we will today. I think the law is a big part of it. Uh, at the moment, I work at the uh, Australia Institute. I've been there for five years. We're a, a, a fairly large and influential Canberra-based think tank with a couple of stragglers around the country like me. And I work almost exclusively on energy market reform. And the reason I focus on that is the, the pain and frustration of almost three decades of climate campaigning in this country. And it is that uh, I think it's very hard to get big ambitious climate policies agreed to by both sides. This we've seen multiple times. But I think now clean is getting cheaper than dirty. Any reforms that open up the NEM to more clean help consumers and help us decarbonise. And that's something I think no one really opposes except the incumbents. So that's my strategy. That's what I'm hoping to discuss today and very much looking forward to the conversation with Lane and any questions you have. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm going to hand over to Lane. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, and uh, a real pleasure to be on today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the stolen lands um, from Aboriginal people. And in fact, it's the, pretty much the same land as Dan, because I think we live about 500 metres from each other, but we can't, can't, obviously can't go near each other under these circumstances. Mm. Look, my, my early career was in the oil and gas industry, um, but I have spent the last 20 years uh, in renewables. Uh, I was the Executive General Manager for Australia for Pacific Hydro, one of Australia's larger renewable energy utilities. Uh, but for the last uh, five years, I've been Head of Renewables at the Impact Investment Group. Um, Impact Investment Group is kind of what the name suggests. We're an impact investor, which means we only create investment opportunities uh, where there's a social and environmental benefit. And clearly, investing in renewable energy uh, fits well within that uh, mandate. Um, so I, I basically built the renewables business uh, at Impact Investment Group by launching a couple of uh, solar funds uh, and some other products, which are now around uh, $250 million in value. Um, so I kind of spend my time day to day is just about trying to find uh, the way to most quickly transition uh, Australia's um, energy system from uh, polluting infrastructure to renewable infrastructure. Uh, also, when I'm not at IIG, I'm also the, uh, the non-executive chair of Environmental Justice Australia, which is you know, a very similar sort of organisation to, um, to EDO. Thank you, Lane, for that introduction. Well, let's dive straight in. And I thought it would be good to set the scene. So I have a question uh, in the first instance for you, Daniel, Jay Cass. And my question is this, well, it starts with a comment really, which is that energy law, like water law, is diabolically complex. I think we can all agree on that. And as a consequence, very few people actually understand the regulatory framework governing energy generation and distribution in this country. Now, I think that's really concerning as it's a framework that's largely determinative of our ability to transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewables, which is exactly what we need to happen at this point in time. So Dan, uh, could you begin by providing the audience with some context? Specifically, you referred to the NEM, uh, which is the acronym representing the national energy market. What is this beast, the national energy market? How does it work? And what role does it play in decarbonising the Australian economy? Over to you. Uh, right. Jeffrey. So, it, well, the, the role is that energy uses about a third, produces about a third of emissions. 
And as we decarbonise other sectors like manufacturing and transport, stationary energy, electricity, will increasingly fuel those processes, moving around cars and trains and even planes mm. and processing raw materials into manufactured goods. So uh, greening electricity is greening much of the, the, the climate problem in successive stages and there are problems and challenges. The question of what, uh, and I think what you're really asking is how does the system work? You're wanting a systemic view in the legal context and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the short answer is there's no short answer, but I'll give you a summary. And I'm actually doing a course in energy law at Melbourne Law School, a graduate diploma. And our lecturer in the core subject um, told us, and I haven't checked this, that Australia's energy law is about 1,800 pages long, and the United Kingdom energy law is about 140. So we have a pretty complex system, and that's actually just scratching the surface. So what I'll do now is, is just very quickly go through what AEMO teaches in about a day, which is um, a bit about the system, a bit about the market, and a bit about governance to give that sort of overview, and then we can dive in. Dan, can I just ask you to explain AMO? Sure, I will. I'll get to that and for the agencies. What does that stand for? Because the Australian Energy Market Operator. Thank you. Runs a, a, an introduction to the NEM seminar, you know, for a lot of foreign executives who come here and want to set up businesses, and it's a day. So I'll right. try to give you a day in four minutes and ring the bell at three. Thanks. <laughs> so the NEM, the National Electricity Market, physically is, is a network. So it's a network of poles and wires from essentially far north Queensland all through New South Wales and Victoria, and then hopping over the Bass Strait uh, through Bass Link to Tasmania and then right down to the southern tip of the state and on the mainland across most of the population centres of South Australia. So it's, it's apparently the largest interconnected network in the world. It's very thin in places in Queensland. There are long wires that have not much on them except some consumers right at the end. So it's a, an engineering marvel. Um, it came out of the uh, economic rationalism of the 80s. It's part of the national um, uh, competition review processes that were started back then. And um, the, the key, uh, and we'll come back to this point, I think, many times, um, is that each state um, is in charge of electricity and each state sets its own price um, through a wholesale market in that NEM region, Victoria and South Wales. But ultimately, the states have... Um, pass their rulemaking powers up to a national federal process and that therein lies a whole complexity that I think we'll uh, get to in the conversation. So it's a, it's a big network covering most of the country, 10 million customers, about $20 billion a year traded in the wholesale market. Our maximum demand is about 35 gigawatts in summer. So a gigawatt is about one big coal-fired power plant. So you need about the equivalent of 35 for summer, but that's only a few hours on a few days that are, are peaks. Generally, the demand is more like 20. And there's about 250 large generators um, with a capacity of about 60 gigawatts in total. Uh, and the problem in the NEM is only 25% of energy, roughly, is uh, renewable, and that includes household solar. So we must decarbonise, uh, and it's a very, very complicated challenge, partly because of the governance problems that I think we'll get into later. Yeah. The key with electricity is we buy energy, but we need the energy to be at a certain uh, voltage and frequency level and stick within narrow tolerances or it doesn't work. So, and that's where things start getting very complicated in an engineering sense and where renewables can start getting scapegoated for problems that aren't really about renewables, but are about system design. So the system was designed to have largely big coal and then peaking gas generators and some hydro provide energy to consumers, but also maintain voltage and frequency the whole time so that the system is kept in this perfect balance and we can keep our devices plugged in. That's been completely upended by the rise of renewables and in particular, the rise of solar PV on households. There are, I think, 1.3 million households with solar uh, power stations on the roof. And this changes uh, the market radically. It turns people who are consumers into producers. And you don't have to be a Marxist to see that's actually a quite revolutionary dynamic that you introduce. Mm -hmm. And because the engineering was built around big coal and gas, it, it, 
it's hard for that solar resource to be incorporated in a way that keeps delivering energy to everyone, but within the voltage and frequency limits that we need. On the topic of unreliability and risk, which is a huge theme in energy uh, politics in this country, fossil fuel plants don't work all the time. And the Australia Institute runs Gas and Coal Watch, where we research this and produce reports and a, a regular log. There's been more than 275 trips since December 2017. And just so you, you're clear, when a large unit in a large coal-fired power plant trips, that's hundreds of megawatts. I mean, you're talking tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands worth of consumers' energy exiting the system. Of course, things don't break down because the system's designed for that unreliability. There's no reason we couldn't engineer the system to deal with the variability of solar and wind, but we haven't. And this becomes a very important issue of, of scapegoating and, and, and regulatory capture and problems. Mm. So the market itself that you, you get your energy from is really opaque. You buy energy on a contract from a retailer and it gives you a price. It's often quite hard to even understand what the price is. And therein there's a lot of energy law to talk about. But behind all that, there's a wholesale market which goes up and down every five minutes. There's a spot price in each NEM region. Uh, that balances supply and demand. The, uh, the, the retailers also use futures and contracts uh, products to hedge the risk that prices will be very high and they haven't got enough energy at that price within their portfolio. Um, several years ago, the large retailers bought generators. So they're now called gen tailors, the big three. They now have dominant market share in most regions and that itself is a big problem and an issue in energy law. Why did the Australian Competition Tribunal allow essentially a breaking of the model of the NEM from distributors, retailers, transmission companies and, and consumers into being this entity, that, into these um, combined entities that are a generator and a retailer. Um, uh, and then just briefly to bills, which is the, the, you know, the hip pocket test for governments, about 30 to 50% of your bill at home is the network. So the cost of the poles and wires. Right. 30 to 40% is the wholesale cost of energy, including that hedging and everything that lies behind that. And then the retail cost and margin is about 10 to 20%. So I'll just talk very briefly about the governance, which I think is where we're, we're going to end up uh, as an audience largely of lawyers. So mixed audience, but people I think a mixed audience. Yeah, it's a mixed audience, but people who are interested in understanding the, the governance framework and problems therein. Right. And and it gets to the core of what Emma was raising at the beginning, which is really critically important about uh, green stimulus and what are the obstacles to the kind of reforms that we yeah. need to see. Yeah. So uh, the NEM is run by COAG, now defunct, so the Council of Australian Governments, which is now becoming this national cabinet subcommittee process. But historically, uh, states are in charge of the NEM. So under Section 51, it's not listed uh, as a Commonwealth power, so therefore electricity is under the state jurisdictions. The formation of the NEM through the 80s and 90s meant ceding authority up to a national level in order to plug everything in so that we have this national market, which should be more efficient and cheaper than having state-based markets. The Australian Energy Market Commission makes the rules that then become this national law. So states then essentially are holding state laws on behalf of this federal body, the Energy Market Commission that, that writes the rules. Then there's an Australian energy regulator that implements them and the Australian uh, energy market operator operates the physical system and the market. And then an energy security board has been there since the Finkel review and it's charged with delivering the 49 out of the 50 Finkel recommendations that were adopted by COAG. So the emissions target was left to the side, but all 49 parts of the blueprint mm. are essentially our plan for decarbonisation. So the problem definition I, I would give back to Emma's question is essentially nobody's in charge of the NEM in the current system, not really. No one is ultimately singularly responsible for what happens. And I don't think you can make a complex transition from dirty to clean without a plan and you can't plan without someone in charge. Mm. So we have 20 coal-fired power plants that will retire because of economics in the next uh, decades. 
they should retire quicker because of climate, but they will retire anyway because of economics. And if the system isn't optimised to deal with reliability in, in a generation mix dominated by clean, we will have a lot of problems and a lot of expense. And that's the idea how to solve it, but there's a lot of law there. But it's something that you can see now. And if we began un unpacking that, we could start to plan for it and roll out the necessary reforms. Look, absolutely. And I think, I think Lane will ha have a lot of experience yeah. with being an investor. Yeah. There are lots of rules that could be changed now that would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would unleash more of the investment from the impact investors he represents right up to the big corporates, including BlackRock, who are now in our generation market and as independent power producers really struggling in a market designed for a different era. And we will get into the rules actually in a little bit more detail because they are so crucial when we're talking about these, these regulatory barriers within the context of the NEM and how they affect decarbonisation. But before we kind of go into the, into the nitty gritty, go down to the granular level, I'm gonna zoom out and hand over to Lane. And um, Lane, I actually would like you to talk about the broader policy settings, if you'd be so kind to do so, uh, and how they influence the uptake of renewables in Australia. And if you could talk about the renewable energy target or RET in particular, that would be fantastic. Can you explain what the RET is and how its current uh, framing is undermining uh, investment in renewables and what needs to change? Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so the renewable energy target was put into place uh, nigh on 10 years ago now, and, uh, and it had a target for 2020. Um, and whilst there's been a lot of machinations along the way, and people might have heard about it because it was reviewed uh, under the Abbott government and, and uh, the, nearly scrapped at one point, um, it has been the policy that has driven renewable investment um, over the last decade. Uh, in particular, I've seen quite a, a boom of renewable investment just in the last um, three to four years. Uh, and that was actually once the, there was confidence in, in, um, across you know, industry and uh, government um, that, that, uh, that it wasn't going to be changed again, that then that, that, that has been delivered. Um, so that's delivered, you know, gigawatts of renewable energy and $10 billion of investment and, and brought us up to the, the kind of 25% mark that, that, that Dan just mentioned. Um, the problem is it, it, it basically flatlines between 2020 and 2030. And we've met that target now. Mm. So in effect, uh, any policy to drive the transition to renewables is now done. There is nothing. Um, so um, now this now the next thing you've kind of heard um, uh, out in the media and, and some politicians have been saying is well, well people now tell us that renewables are, are competitive or cheaper than you know coal and gas fired generation, and that is correct. Um, so therefore we don't need to do anything anymore. Um, but I think Dan hit on it before is the only investment signal now to change over from uh, polluting uh, incumbent infrastructure to renewable infrastructure is the closure of coal-fired power stations. Mm. So it, we literally sit and wait for the market signals mm. that, uh, that, that come from the closure of a, a coal-fired power station. It's, it's kind of as simple as that. And Dan also sort of hit the correct point that that's not fast enough. That's the reality. So, you know, we're signed up to a Paris Agreement uh, with a target of 1.5 degrees. That effectively means to achieve that and taking into account that, you know, the, in Australia, uh, the energy sector is the low hanging fruit for emissions reduction. Um, we need to be effectively 100% renewables by 2030. So that is the target that we should be looking at. Um, and, but we have no target that's driving us in that direction. So it's not that it needs, um, you know, 
so much as financial incentive, it needs something to drive the change. Because it, as an investor, um, there is no, the, the, the reason to invest has, has literally um, reduced substantially just in the last, last few years. So if, the policy, if there's not a policy in place to drive that transition, um, then it, it, it literally won't happen. And we're, we're expecting to see a, a significant reduction in investment in, in the next few years. Mind you, there, just to say, there are some state-based policies that will drive investment. And they will basically be uh, what what drives anything over the next few years. And to some extent, um, what we call power purchase agreements. So this is where a a corporate, uh, like a big corporate, says, "Okay, I, I want to go renewable." Mm -hmm. So I'll enter into a uh, a longer term agreement for electricity. I'm going to stop buying it on a sort of two to three year contract, and I'm going to buy it on a longer contract and deal directly with, you know, a, an owner and operator of, of solar and wind farms. So Lane, if I've correctly understood, what you're saying is that we need to hit 100% renewables by 2030 in Australia if we're going to meet our Paris Agreement targets. At the moment, there isn't an overarching policy which incentivizes um, investors to um, invest in renewables so that we are able to hit that target. So what we really require is the federal government to intervene and to introduce a more ambitious um, RET. Uh, well, whether it's a renewable energy target or whether it was a, a, an emissions trading scheme or, you know, we've been through the complete basket of uh, of policy ideas, some have been in and then out, and some you know get about 24 hours of hearing, and then someone stamps on them. Um, look, they can all work, um, and they can all do what you need to do. I, I don't think we're short of policy options; we're just short of intent. Yeah, and we just need that political will. But we yeah, absolutely, and I think most people understand that that yeah. that 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 is the case. Well, I mean, I think some people kind of hang on to the hope that it'll, it'll happen anyway, because a lot of the states support investment in renewables and there are states that have ambitious decarbonisation policies. But what you're saying is it's not going to happen by stealth. There needs to be leadership at the federal level. Correct. Okay. Yes, it's just not going to happen quickly enough. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so... I'm actually now going to return to the NEM. So we've kind of zoomed out and Lane has very eloquently explained that we need that leadership at the national level if we're going to um, hit 100% renewables by 2030, but we're going to move back into the NEM. And those rules that govern the operation of uh, energy markets in Australia. So this is a twofold question. The first part is, is can each of you identify, say, for example, two rules uh, within, the, within the context of the NEM that are holding back uh, investments in renewables? And how easy is it to change these rules? And maybe, maybe we'll go over to Dan and you can start, please. Sure. So, uh, look, the point that, Main, that Lane was making is, is, is right, that states have good, even ambitious renewable energy targets. And, but just to make it clear for the audience why there's a conflict still, a state can procure energy that uh, can, can sign PPAs and have various kinds of auction systems that get renewable energy built. But then those um, power plants are trading in a wholesale market and frequency and ancillary services markets uh, and so on that are run by the federal regulator. And so the problem that the Australia Institute is trying to work on is even if you have states setting good targets and liberal states as well as labor states, if the market doesn't allow those renewable energy uh, generators to operate profitably, it's effectively dragging down the value of uh, those state-based schemes and adding to their cost and allowing coal to stay on 
even when it's not in pure market terms competitive anymore. So it's still incredibly important that we get these rules changed. So I'll just speak briefly about one rule that I um, learned about when I was on the board of Hepburn Wind and we were building our community owned wind farm, the first in the country. And we'd gone through the process of working out how to raise the $10 million and how we buy the equipment and get the turbines connected to the grid and build the statcom and so on. And then we, we get told by the, the market operator, AEMO, that there's this thing called MLFs. And as a director, I probably shouldn't admit that I didn't even know what it was. There's my director's <laughs> duty. Fiduciary duties exploded. Fiduciary <laughs> gone. So we got a letter saying, you know, dear energy newcomers, um, not all electrons are created equal. And as much as we valorise coal in this country, all those electrons out in the Latrobe Valley aren't particularly useful because they're not near your toaster and your toaster needs the electron. They've got to come through big wires and there's a lot of losses along the way. And so the way we deal with this is there's a marginal loss factor applied to the actual price you get when you settle energy in the market. So we're selling our energy in the wholesale market. We're building a wind farm in north, just northwest of Melbourne. So it's a bit of the grid where there's no big transmission networks like in the east of the state. There's uh, no great incentive to have a particularly strong network. There's no loads of manufacturing. And so essentially it's a pretty weak bit of network. No criticism of the engineers. It's just not a big priority part of the grid. And so our electrons were more useful than those dirty coal ones from Morwell. So effectively we were told we would get a, a negative marginal loss factor. We would get an uplift of 10%. So for every kilowatt of energy we sold in the market for say $100, we'd get $110. So as directors, it was, well, that's an easy 10% on the bottom line <laughs> just for sitting there. And, it, it, and it's, a, it's a rule that made sense in the past, but at the moment it's creating uncertainty for solar companies that build solar, even incentivized by good state government policies. They plug into a bit of the grid where, then, where suddenly there's more competitors also plugging in excellently well-built and financed and engineered solar farms that suddenly become harder to run at a profit mm. because of a, a loss factor formula that was devised for the age of coal. Uh, Lane would know much more about it than me because he's operating plants currently, but I know that the um, international investors who are keen to pour money into generation here in Australia are incredibly concerned about that and other rules that were really hangovers from another era and now stand in the way of investment, therefore stand in the way of jobs and therefore stand in the way of decarbonisation. We need to do our bit for the planet. Mm -hmm. And so how would you change that rule, Dan? What would you do? Well, there are all sorts of options on the table and, and some better than others. Um, but essentially the process is you would need to sit down with experts from um, clean energy finance and engineering to work out a rule that would be compatible with the, the kind of engineering goals of the system so that we can price things properly and deliver reliability. It might even tie into other markets that the um, regulators are looking at constructing. So there are day ahead and other kinds of market other than the, the real time spot market that we uh, that dominates essentially our, our market design. And the process is you would put a rule change in, so it would be a, a submission to the Australian Energy Market Commission, and the staff would then pass through it and decide whether it's got merit and so on and pass a report up to the commissioners. And if they think it's worthy enough to consider, they would start essentially a public hearings process, such as you would have in other countries around the world, to determine does this have merit and does it meet the... Um, overarching goal of energy law in Australia, which is this thing called the National Electricity Objective, which is written into statute in all those state laws and managed by the AMC, which is essentially that rule changes must be um, uh, framed so that they produce benefits to consumers in reducing price, but maintain reliability. And Lane's got some ideas about how we could improve those goals. He might want to jump in. Okay. But does that make sense, Em? So it's, a, it's essentially a regulatory process, not a policy one in theory, to fix all these obstacles to renewables growth. It does, sound, it does sound reasonably complex. And you've alluded to the fact that there are dozens of rules that need to change. 
is it, is it in each instance a complex and time consuming process? Incredibly. So I recently co-sponsored a rule change that got through yeah. for wholesale right. demand response reform, which was really important. It was on the agenda in 2002. So the pair review, Energy Minister under John Howard proposed that there should be um, megawatts of conserved energy bidding into the market against megawatts of generated energy. So essentially you allow big factories to turn down energy when the price is high and they get paid the spot price they've avoided uh, a, 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 as compensation. And so this rule change brings in a, a reform that was floated almost two decades ago. I mean, at that rate, 20 years per significant market reform, we won't be ready to exit coal for 100 years. Which is not uh, feasible. Which it's just infeasible. So what the Energy Security Board is doing, which is made up of the energy market bodies and two independent chair and deputy chair, is they're working towards the big reboot of the NEM. It's called the Post-2025 Market Redesign. And at the Australia Institute, we have some concerns about it, but think overall it's excellent and it's a very good initiative. It's the right thing to be doing. And it would rewrite the rules of the NEM, not to force decarbonisation, which is actually necessary environmentally, or even specifically mandate the exit of coal, but it would set up rules that mean as coal exits, renewables can um, monetize all the services they can provide, frequency control and so on, uh, uh, such that they have certainty. And in, in theory, investors will then have the market signal. They will know they can really invest because each time there's a coal plant retiring, there's a, a long notice period of at least three years and so on, you can make the investments happen. Whereas at the moment, I, I feel like Lane, that the market signal is so confused and jumbled that we might have coal leaving in a rush and there may not even be enough renewables and batteries and so on there to replace all of those reliability services because the signal was not designed for the era of transition. Mm. Thanks, Dan. I might actually hand over to you, Lane, because you might want to respond to some of what Dan said as, as well as propose your own um, rule changes which you think are crucial at this juncture. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and look, um, uh, the regular change in the energy space is often described as glacial uh, in its speed. Um, but, but Dan's right, the, 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 there is an acknowledgement at least that the, the, this is a system in transition. So it, it, it is acknowledged by rule makers that we can't keep going how we've been going in the past because regardless of any policy setting, we know that it's going to change. We know that it's going, it's moving only in this, in the direction of renewables. Um, what we were talking about before is how fast, um, but at least they understand that it, that it has to change to accommodate, you know, um, you know, the system being majority uh, renewables. So w the one thing I would say that that m will make one significant difference that just kind of outweighs everything else from my point of view. Mm -hmm. And that is actually law reform rather than like rule changes. I mean, there, there are a myriad of rule changes going on and Dan's quite right, you know, marginal loss factors is one that has really rippled through the investment um, fraternity and, and is, is, is a difficult risk to manage. But in terms of getting the change done and getting it done as quickly as possible and, and in the most efficient way possible, that is to change the national electricity objectives, yeah. uh, as Dan alluded to earlier. So they are, as he kind of said, they, they, there are a set of, of objectives which are around price, quality, safety, reliability and security of supply. They, they are named right up in the front of the national electricity law. And every time a regulator looks at a, a rule change decision, they have to go back to those objectives. Now, whether it's the, the Australian Energy Market Commission doing a rule change or the market operator um, uh, looking to put a rule change in place or, or even the regulator who's ensuring that people are doing it as it should be done, um, those objectives are absolutely key. And my view is we need an emissions reduction objective. So something that, that refers out or connects to the policy, obviously there has to be a policy as well, but 
mm. but let's just put that to the side for the moment. But it connects to the policy and, it, and, and the rule changes, the people making the rule change decisions have to take that into account. And at the moment, they don't. So the AEMC has been able to do, put through a myriad of rule changes which are, which are not helpful in the transition. And that has been the history we've had for the last 10 to 20 years. And it's very frustrating uh, and it slows everything down and it's inefficient. And we're having a rule change right now where, oh, I don't know if I should go into it actually, it's gonna take about five minutes to explain the rule change. Um, and uh, it, it, it just means that it, it can, the rule change can be considered without considering all the other broader implications of it happening. Mm -hmm. And um, it's such that, that it'll, it could be a very poor outcome for re renewable generators. Mm -hmm. so, um, so for me, there's just one thing you do, and then it would cascade right through the whole regulatory system. And um, now, I think you're going to ask me next, well, how easy is that? I um, was. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, hard to say. I mean, one of the problems, I mean, we're all liking a national cabinet because they came together to kind of help us get through this this COVID pandemic, right? And states working together with the government. That's great. The problem is, from the energy sector's point of view, is they're moving from the COAG to a national cabinet is no longer transparent. So that operates under the sort of cabinet confidentiality conventions. Yeah. And we don't know what's going on anymore. We don't know what's being said. And so I don't know how possible it is anymore to, to, to move something through that arrangement. So it's very uncertain. So I don't think I can, you know, you, you'd have to push a rule change through, you know, the states and the feds up through the, um, through the departments and, and, and get the buy-in, eventual buy-in or enough pressure on various ministers to, to get it to happen. Um, Can I just, Lane, just on that point, do you think it was a deliberate move to transition to a cabinet, um, a cabinet framework precisely because it's associated with cabinet and confidence? Was it a deliberate I, attempt to be less transparent? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't think I'll opine on that because right, you don't opine, but we can certainly all we can all cogitate over that, and the consequence is that it's more difficult for people to access information about something that's so crucial to it's, the it's another decarbonisation of this country. Yeah, it's another backward step in, in a way because one of the things that governments have got away with in Australia is using the complexity of the energy systems yeah. to basically tell mistruths to the public mm. year on year on year. Mm. Can and you, they, and can renewables provide, get, what's that, sorry? Can you provide an example? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, for example, the um, back uh, the Queensland government prior to this one used to blame renewable energy for the high energy prices. Um, what was the name, uh, government um, beforehand? Uh, Newman. Campbell Newman. Newman, yeah. Newman government. Up on record every month saying, you know, you're all paying high prices because yeah. of renewable energy. It's it's absolute rubbish. The, the, um, all the reports, government reports that had come out showed that it was, it was number one was poles and wires. Yeah. Increased in the cost. And then other retail costs. And, the, and there was a... Uh, also a cost uh, to uh, in the wholesale energy sector but um, but the bulk of that was because investment had stalled at that point because of the confusing uh, policy arrangements that were going on so you know that that was a clear case of misrepresentation and that happens all over the place and it's because it's difficult to unpack mm -hmm. and journalists don't know how to unpack it it just never gets properly righted so sort anyway i'll get off that that hobby well, horse. it's actually it's actually a, a really crucial point and it's fundamental to good governance and democracy and there are some parallels really with water as well which is extremely complex and it means that something that's really vital for the entire country something that everyone should understand um is completely obscure and correct so, and and, and, that's and i think you can also 
lay a large amount of blame uh, at, with the Murdoch media as well, who have a an anti-renewable stance. That's that's very clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But just in terms of the complexity, that is, I mean, to me, it's fundamentally undemocratic. And it's a question for both of you before we move on, because I think it's really important. Is there scope to simplify the regulatory frame, framework? And it's actually, you know, it's, there's a question, I have been keeping note of the questions just for people in the audience. And there was a question which is kind of tied to that concept. Somebody basically asked, you know, do we, do we fix the current framework or to what extent can we decarbonise by fixing the current framework? And to what extent should we kind of start afresh and come up with something new? Right. So, I mean, I guess there's there's a number of levels that this can be done, whether it's um, legislative or, you know, um, structural and organisational or within the rules and process that there is, um, that we currently have, which can, you know, could write radically different rules for the market. I think it's worth just explaining why at the Australia Institute we've focused on what we call our energy market strategy. And it's not um, an either or um, debate between this and other um, climate action, including you know, litigation to close down coal or setting strong national targets through political um, uh, parties and elections and so on. But it just seems to us that there is a problem in Australia. And the problem is, um, the coalition seems to have a problem with facts. And that's not a partisan position at all. It's evidence-based. I'll give an example. In 2017, we brought out Congressman Bob Inglis to Australia and I organised this tour. I met him. And you met Bob at, at um, Gilbert and Tobin. So he has a 100% voting um, record with the NRA. I mean, he is as right-wing Republicans go. The National Rifle Association. Right, gold standard. So he's from the Carolinas. Uh, he, he's uh, an evangelical Christian man, as his family are, very principled. You, you, you would think that that would be a messenger that the coalition could hear. And I, I, I can't give any details, but we, we did um, bring Bob to parliaments in Victoria and other jurisdictions, including the federal parliament. He met with Tony Kelly and Josh Frydenberg, then the minister and the whole backbench committee of the coalition government, mm. environment backbench committee. He, he, he still couldn't really get the science across. That's a problem. I mean, if the coalition has a problem with science, it's very difficult to get them to adopt a policy based on the science. I think we still need to try and there are many factions in the party and, and, and state governments, as Lane and I both mentioned, state Liberal governments are doing a terrific job on energy. So New South Wales in particular is building out these vast renewable energy zones in the central western Rana and New England regions. And uh, the Minister Baird and the government there have made clear these will get the state ready for Liddell to close and and keep the economy going when subsequent coal plants retire. And that's a fantastic policy and they're doing a good job. But our view is it's worth also having um, a strategy which is, is sort of politics proof. And that's what our regulatory work is. And so I, I still think we need the big national targets, of course. And I think what Lane's saying about changing the NEO is really a brilliant strategy. And I think, you know, he was one of the first people to say it. So it's really a credit to him. I think it's very clear. It's smart energy law. However, whilst we're waiting for a breakthrough, we can have important breakthroughs in energy regulation. And if Australia implemented the 49 recommendations of the Finkel Review, I saw Chloe Munro was on the call before. I don't know if she's still there, but, you know, she and... Alan and the other members of the, of the review did an excellent job. And those 49 recommendations would really set us up well. Mm -hmm. And they highlighted demand response as one of those reforms. And, you know, credit to the Energy Market Commission that they finally, even belatedly, did pass the reform and have introduced that, that rule change. So we do need the big picture. And it's great to talk 
about what that could be. But at the same time, these rule changes can proceed through the energy regulatory process we have already, even under the NEO that is flawed and bring real benefits to consumers. And I'll just end quickly on a note that gives you an example of what might be um, the scale of the benefit. UNSW did some um, analysis of demand response in Queensland on uh, heatwave days in 2017 when the price peaked very high yeah. and they were inferring the demand response in the market by analysing you know, data in the market. They didn't actually have factories tell them how much they turned down to avoid the price spikes. But they calculated consumers saved $100 million in one afternoon from big factories turning down to avoid paying very high wholesale prices. If demand response can save 100 million a day in one NEM region, imagine how much it could save consumers over the coming summers as global warming gets worse across all NEM regions in Australia. And it, Lane's 100% right, we need more and we should demand more as you know, concerned citizens. We need more from both federal political parties. Uh, but it, while we're waiting for those changes that we, we must have, mm -hmm. changing the rules, getting them right, and working with the regulatory system we already have, which sounds very conservative, I know, but working within the system can deliver huge benefits to consumers and the environment. And I think it's the kind of thing that, you know, smart lawyers at the EDO and policy people at the Australia Institute and the investors like Lane and the commercial inve investors could achieve, and I would just end by saying, I think we need to keep this conversation going and work better together across those areas of expertise and economic mm. investors to, to get a, a, more of, a, 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 of momentum in these reform processes because they are important. And just quickly, because I do think this is important, there seems to be an interface here between kind of regulatory change and the expediency lack thereof of those changes. What you're proposing is to use the existing framework. You can get some good rule changes. They can help um, create the incentive that's required to invest or to a certain extent create that incentive. But can we do it quickly enough? Yeah. Well, I, look, I got involved in climate change in 1991 and I read the IPCC and cried because I thought we can't get this fast enough. I mean, in 91, I thought we can't do this because we can't take on fossil fuels. Democracy just isn't that good at putting lobbyists in the corner and doing what's right mm. when big money is at stake. So, I, I mean, I don't have an answer for what's good enough, but I can say demand response was a success. The commission is very pleased with their decision. And let's just step back and look at that political problem that we're all seeing as intractable. Before the rule change went through, after the Finkel review, Josh Frydenberg, the energy minister, endorsed the reform wholeheartedly. State Liberal ministers endorsed the reform, Don Harwin in New South Wales. The, New South, the South Australian energy minister um, put in his own rule change demanding wholesale demand response reform from the AEMC. I mean, it doesn't get much better than the minister demanding a rule change. And then when it came through last month, uh, as you would have seen in the coverage, Angus Taylor was very um, supportive of the reform. Mm. So it, it, even whilst we have some problems with the coalition politics around energy and their reluctance to accept the science, these market benefits that help consumers are actually impossible to reject. I mean, you can't, you can't publicly advocate for Byzantine market structures that push up energy prices and also make it impossible to hit the Paris target. So not discounting the big picture that, and I'm glad Lane put it on the table because he's 100% right. Yeah. I just wanted to, to, to give the stump speech on behalf of the Australia Institute that our, the energy markets work is not the solution to the climate dilemma in Australia at all, but it's a very important process that can continue even whilst politicians argue and possibly even grandstand and tell mistruths, as Lane has pointed out it can proceed at that next level down, which as we know, right. regulatory and maybe even, you know, litigious statutory interpretation and judicial review and so on could have a role, but it's essentially a regulatory, not a political set of changes. That's all. Okay. Thanks, Dan. We're running out of time. Um, 
we've had some questions about gas as a transition fuel, which is something I, I had hoped we would touch on. So we'll move quickly to that. It's important. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about gas as a, as a transition fuel or whether, and whether or not it's necessary. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe we'll go over to Lane. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, well, look, it's interesting. Uh, you don't even have to, you know, hear my opinion. I, you literally go to the market operator. Um, they've modelled out, um, you know, into the early 2040s of what the system will look like um, with a, a great deal of the coal-fired power stations already retired by then. Uh, and they've done the work and the bulk of it, um, obviously there's a lot of renewables coming, but that does need um, some support in terms of firming for dispatchable capacity. Um, and so they've basically worked out um, how to make the system work reliable, reliably and, um, uh, and, and stay secure. Uh, so they've got more interconnection, they've got pumped hydro, uh, energy storage, uh, some batteries, and what, and some demand side participation, which is exactly what um, Dan was just talking about before. So that's where, under certain conditions, uh, the users of electricity actually pull back their demand uh, when there is a, um, a shortfall of generation. Um, and what you see in those graphs is there's really no growth in gas whatsoever. So this kind of leads to this factor of why is the government talking about a gas-led recovery when the market operator right. is saying there's not, that's not going to happen. Right. Um, so it's, a, um, it's in completely inconsistent. And, uh, and, and the days of a gas being a transition fuel, you know, of real significance, I mean, it will play a part, but it's not going to be this massive growth opportunity. That, mm -hmm. Those days have gone. It's been in past, and and it and it went in past because the price of gas gas priced itself out of the um, out of the local market by connecting into the international markets. And so, so thank you for that, Lane. That's an excellent explanation. And just quickly, Dan. So, from an economic and structural perspective, renewables can get us there. Is that right? There's no doubt. And the point with clean energy competition is it was known in the 70s that solar was on a learning curve and that for every doubling of solar installed the price dropped 18 20 percent it's the same reason that computers get more powerful every year and your iphone does more and more for the same 800 dollars or thousand dollars that it costs to buy it was always known that clean would win the energy wars mm. and and the earlier you invest to bring the engineering down the cost curve, the cheaper energy is in the long run because it's a long run game energy. The overnight cost of something isn't what matters, it's everything, the overnight cost and then the system cost and then the running cost of the input fuels and operations and maintenance. There's no input cost for solar and wind, it's free. That, that's the whole point. So th th there's no doubt, there was a lot of sophistry and hot wind um, about the cost of renewables they were always they were always going to win the energy wars and that's actually what's at stake it's a war it's been a war and they okay. were always going to win okay on price yep all right i think we're going to have to there were a few more questions there was a really good question or a couple of good questions about hydrogen which we won't get to hmm. but um I'm proposing that we write up a summary of today's talk and we can perhaps say something about hydrogen in that article that we write to publish in the next edition of Insight, which is the EDO's bulletin that goes out every fortnight. So if people can just hold tight for, for the article that we will co-write, we'll, we'll touch on hydrogen in that piece. Um, we could go on because this is such a dense and important subject, but we do have to wind up. Thank you both so much for lending your expertise. Uh, thank you to everyone who's come along today. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Uh, 
Ah, we've got a lovely comment here. Very interesting conversation. Looking forward to the next exciting episode. Well, on that note, mm. our next webinar is going to focus on corporations law and superannuation law and the kinds of reforms that are required to stimulate green economic growth. And that's going to happen on the 31st of August. We'll obviously publicise that well in advance. Our speakers for that event are Tim Gordon, who's a mergers and acquisitions partner at Gilbert and Tobin, Kirsten Hunter, who is the founder and managing director of Future Super, and Phil Vernon, who's the former managing director of C and CEO of Australian Ethical Investment, and he also happens to be on the board of the EDO. So um, we'll wind up. Thank you so much, and look out for that piece that we're going to put in insight in a few weeks. All right. Well, thank you, EDO and Emma, and thanks, Lane. Lovely to see you from across the suburb. Yeah, great event. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Stay safe, both of you down there in Melbourne, and the same to everybody else. Thanks, Emma. Thanks. 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 Bye. See you, Dan.